Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to The 100 Report. I'm Chris. I'm Charlie. And we are going to be doing the Manchester Originals today. We're going to do the, the men's team followed by the women's team and that's going to be our format throughout because it is one team, two squads format. So the big news is Manchester obviously had eight spots to fill in from the draft and they did that and they've completely revamped their squad. So if any of our listeners remember last year, the three overseas players that Manchester had were Imran Tahir, Dan Christian and Mitchell Sandler. Now, all three of them have gone and they have been replaced with three other internationals. And we've also seen a couple of other little moves because one of the international players that they picked up actually moved from Southern Brave. They've also got rid of one of their local players. They got rid of um, Saki Mahmood, who subsequently has moved to um, Oval Invincibles. Um, they also got hit quite hard with the Colpac uh, stuff. So as we mentioned in a previous podcast, Colpac players are overseas players who, through a strange loophole before Brexit happened, were considered d- d- domestic players. So players like Wayne Parnell, Dane Villas, um, uh, Marshall DeLange were all Colpac players and they've subsequently gone. But let's get straight into it. The first and most obvious is the flagship player. It's the test contracted player. That's Joss Butler. You don't really need to say much about him, do you? No, I'm glad they managed to, um, obviously the teams all got to retain a couple of players mm. on the same contract as, as previously. So yeah, go figure that they stuck with Joss Butler. I definitely would too. Uh, he's just amazing with the bat when it comes to shorter formats and so much franchise experience and great behind the stump. So they've got themselves an amazing wicketkeeper batsman there. Definitely, definitely. They've, they've got a, a glut of wicketkeepers as well because one of the first overseas players that they picked up was Nicholas Poran, who obviously recently had a wonderful time in the IPL, has been out and about doing franchise cricket. He's kind of a stalwart of one of the the West Indies short form cricket. Top order batsman, does keep wicket as well um, uh, from Trinidad. And he led the Warriors to victory in the Abu Dhabi T10. Now, I think personally, the Abu Dhabi T10 is probably a good litmus test for how well people are going to do in this game. He's also a backup wicketkeeper uh, as well. So you have two international quality wicketkeepers there in Nicholas Poran and Joss Butler. We also have Kagiso Rabada. Now, you, <laughs> you don't need to say anything, do you, really? I'm so happy they picked him up. I mean, he had the most amazing season with the IPL last year and often does, actually. Um, just what a formidable bowler and what a great attack to open with. He's going to be super difficult to go up against. Definitely. I think it says a lot that he's still playing. There's, there are greats of the South African game and they're usually fast bowlers. So people talk about Mackay and Tini, Sean Pollock, Alan Donald, people like that. But people talk about Kigisa Rabada in the same vein. And I think that is a measure of how good he is. And he's a fiery character as well. I think he's going to be very entertaining. It's strange, isn't it? Because you compare what they've gone for compared to what they had you think Imran to here Mitchell Santner Dan Christian obviously Mitchell Santner's a slow left arm bowler and Imran to here's a leg spinner so they had two quality spin bowlers but they've replaced that and, and Dan Christian who's a strong all-rounder kind of medium pace ish bowling they've now gone for a wicketkeeper top order batsman probably one of the fastest fast bowlers around and a real boon as far as their overseas players go. Uh, but they've also picked up in their third player, Shadab Khan, who is obviously a Pakistan leg spinning all rounder who was at the Southern Braves and has moved. And we think he was released from Southern Braves so that they could retain David Warner. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we know from last season that the Southern Brave had such a pace attack. They were going to pace all out. That, that he was one of their only spin bowlers. So I'm interested to see what it looks like now for them. But no, it's great that he's come to Manchester Originals and to team up with Kagisa Rabada, um, they've got a really strong attack there, whether it's spin or seam. He's been captaining Islamabad in the PSL and has been doing a real good job of it. So I think it's good to have that senior player mentality, especially having a collection of sort of leaders. You think of Joss Butler, who has captained England before. You've got Kakiza Rabada, who's a senior bowler. You've got Shadal Khan, who has had captaincy experience. It's all boding really well. I think 
last year we were a little bit uh, about the original squad, but Simon yeah. Kovacic and his team have quite clearly gone a completely different direction and they've gone with it. They're looking much stronger now, which is why I think you were tickling with the idea of moving your allegiances up north to a different team. So we'll see how you feel <laughs> after finishing this one. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. It feels a little bit, it feels a little, a little bit strange turncoat, but it's hard to argue. But in what you were talking about, about the spin bowling department, Manchester, whilst it does have some pace bowlers, it's, they have quite a lot of spin bowlers, but we'll get to that. One of them is another local player, uh, Matt Parkinson, who has been on the fringes of England as a leg spinner. A lot of the fans thought that Matt Parkinson should have gone to play in India in place of somebody like Don Bess. It would have been interesting, and it's always exciting to have a leg spinner, especially because with the exception of Adil Rashid, um, it's sort of Mason Crane. England don't really produce leg spinners that much, so it's very exciting to have somebody like that. Yeah, it's a shame he missed out on the India tour. I think that his name has been spoken around the England camps for, for quite, a, quite a while now, so it'll be interesting to see when he does get that opportunity. He's still quite young, yeah. um, but he's a terrific bowler. Yeah, I think it's a testament to his quality that he was named in the squad uh, for Sri Lanka before COVID hit. Next up, uh, we've got Joe Clark. He was one of the players that was retained, a uh, batsman. He's the wicketkeeper for Knotts. Um, he averages 26 with a bat in the blast, which is respectable. Um, he doesn't really have any franchise experience apart from the blast, which is great in itself. But when you think he's going to be playing next to players like Joss Butler, Nicholas Poran, and um, keep it, potentially keeping wicket to somebody like Akisa Rabada, it's going to be a real... <laughs> Good <yeah>. luck. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what's, so great. that's what's so great about the 100, is that you team up local players and young talent yeah. Um, with such international superstars and that's how I think India have just an array of talent because they've had such success from the IPL so I think this is exactly why the, the 100 is going to do great stuff for the, for the county game even in, in England. Um, another player that was retained was Phil Salt. Now a lot of people who know the franchise game will know Phil Salt. He's been in, in and around the BBL, he's had some franchise experience, he's a really promising top order batsman so I think he's going to be excellent firepower at the top of the order when you think you know in my ideal world you're probably going to open with Josh Butler probably Nicholas Poran as well so Phil Saab for me is somebody who's going to fit in that top order and probably be a stalwart uh, unless he gets picked for England next up uh, Wayne Madsen so Wayne Mad Madsen is um, uh, one of the other players that has been retained um, yeah, an all-rounder. He, he he is a South African, but he's got a UK passport, so he he doesn't have to worry about the whole Colpack thing. But he's more than a useful player, um, and he bats all over the place for Derbyshire, for example. He's batted as high as three, but he's an all-rounder, and his stats are really actually quite good. His batting average is thirty, and his bowling average is twenty-one. So I think Wayne Madsen again. He's probably. He strikes me as the player who's probably going to end up doing a lot of the donkey work. So as in, if if one of the bowlers is getting carted, he's probably going to come in and bowl five balls. Um, he's probably going to be uh, somebody who floats around the order. So say, for example, if you've got a big hitter, they might want to push Shadow Khan up the order so he can have a hit. And Wayne Madsen is probably somebody who is down to bat at six or seven or something like that, but might give way if there's only 20 balls left. Um, the next one was another movement. Um, it's Harry Gurney, because um, Harry Gurney last year, as um, many people who will know from the first draft, was at Trent Rockets. Um, and uh, he's, a, he's a fast bowler, left-handed. Um, he has been in and around the England squad. It, it feels like he's dropped off a little bit now. He's a more than useful bowler. And we've discussed the importance of left-handers in the game before, right? Yeah, and also... Doesn't he have quite good stats as a death, um, death over bowler as well, Harry Gurney? Which I think that they were, you know, hoping that, I think, you know, for some of these players, it has been a while since they've had, um, you know, international games or, or, or big tournaments between each other, because obviously from COVID. Um, but I think with Harry Gurney, he had um, good stats as a death over bowler. So I'm hoping that, well, they obviously are, are keen the fact that he got snapped up by another team. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether whether he is played towards the end. It must have been it must have been quite a relief for Harry Gurney because he got released from the, the Trent Rockets squad. But you think of all of the people who had 
contracts to play in the inaugural hundred who now have uh, now have lost those contracts. So I'd imagine it's great for Harry Gurney because he still gets to play. But again, it's it's the left arm angle. He's got loads of variations as well, which I think in something as short as the hundred is going to be really useful. Those back of the hand slow balls, those cutters. Um, yeah. Um, he he reminds me of Pat Brown a little bit, as in Pat Brown and Harry Gurney have a sort of a similar style. Harry is Harry Gurney's a bit faster, which again is going to be very useful. He's definitely going to be bowling, and he's one of the pace bowlers that's going to be working alongside their other signing, who wasn't picked up in the first hundred draft. And I sort of can understand why, but as soon as I saw his name on the team sheet, I went. Of course. Why, why wouldn't you select this person? It's Stephen Finn. And we were so surprised last year that he didn't get picked up. But I know that he was battling with injuries. He did a lot on, um, on the broadcasting side of things mm -hmm. last year for TMS. And I wonder whether that was something to do with his rehab, whether he wasn't quite ready yet and whether he was you know, still trying to get to his full fitness. Because, yeah, he's, he's a name that that I would have definitely, you know, assumed that would have been picked up before. So it's great that he's got an opportunity this year to be in one of the teams. For sure, for sure. And there was also quite a lot of things. Could you remember, it was, which year was it? Oh, it was the mauling we got in Australia. Um, 2016, was it? Tw was it <laughs> um, oh, it was just, oh, it was awful. It was that year where Mitchell Johnson just ripped everybody apart. Um, Stephen Finn was down there to bowl, but... I think it all started with that incident where Graham Smith um, was facing him and he was complaining because every now and then Stephen Finn's knee would knock the bales off. And then that, it must be really hard because that must be quite a difficult thing to, to come through because you, it's a hard enough thing having to bowl and they talk about the yips and um, you hate using that phrase, but it felt like that. But having said that, his county credentials are good enough in my view and he's had loads of international experience he's quick he's definitely a potential to open the bowling opposite Kiki Sarabada I think they would actually complement each other quite well yeah me too and I think that he because of his experience with England and and internationally he's he he's used to that pressure he knows what it feels like so I think that that would be a good team to open the bowling one of the other seam options that they've got is Jamie Overton so him and his brother, who his brother is playing down at uh, the Southern Braves, um, if he ever gets a game based on their fast bowling ranks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's been in the squad. Uh, he's played in the Abu Dhabis. He's been in, on the fringes of the England squad. Um, he's very tall, so he's quite awkward to play. He's not as fast as you think he's going to be, but he's certainly quick enough. But pace isn't everything in these short form games we've seen time and time again that if you are comfortably bowling 75 80 miles an hour but you know how to bowl and you can bowl variations and things like that you're gonna be you're gonna be fine and, and especially yeah. from that angle that height is going to be really hard for anybody to try and hit I think that um, him and Harry Gurney are going to be spending a lot of time fighting over places I think he's going to be a bit more of a dead cert when players go away for international duties so I'd imagine if Kigisa Rabada has to go away for a South Africa match then uh, Jamie Overton's going to be up there in terms of coming in to replace him. One of the new ones this is this is the next one so I'd never heard of this player before um, I was a bit I was a bit bad and I didn't really follow the county game much last year. Um, it's so strange during all of this isn't it you, you find strange things during lockdown to keep yourself occupied but your mind just drifts away from loads of other things. You know, I think it was so um, disturbed with coronavirus and such. I don't blame you for not keeping up to date with the latest. I don't think I did either. Yeah, well, they, they had the Bob Willis Trophy, but it obviously wasn't the full county championship in the same way. But uh, one of the players that came out of it is a young player called Tom Lamanby. Manchester picked him up for forty k. That was his first um, first season as a as a full fledged professional. He's 20 years old. He's got a lot of potential. Um, he bats at number six for Somerset, and he's got a pretty decent average. He's got um, an average of 29 with a ball uh, and uh, 23 with a bat. Um, but the thing that stuck out for me was his first class average. And I always think that's a testament of your technique and your skill. His 
their first class batting average is 51. That's, that's ridiculously good. You, you can't really judge somebody off one season, um, but the last time somebody had a batting average that high, they were jumped into the England squad so quickly. Uh, uh, Hasib Hamid, who um, we haven't seen for a little while, but we'll see him again, no worries. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the next one is uh, Colin Ackerman, who was another new acquisition for them. Batsman, uh, captains Leicestershire. Um, yeah, and he, he, he bowls off break, but he's, uh, he's an all-rounder. Now, he has had international experience. Colin Ackerman uh, did play T20 internationals for the Netherlands. So I think that's really going to count in terms of squad experience. Um, you know, and you never want to, you never want to decry uh, minor nations cricket because the standard is still extremely high. I don't know if you know this about me, but when I, um, for those of you who don't know, I used to live in America and I used to play cricket there. And a couple of the guys that I remember facing in the net used to play for the United States of America. And I had no idea like what I was expecting because you never really think of the USA as a cricket team. But they had one guy who was bowling the absolute speed of sound. Um, oh. and, uh, and I asked him, can you, can you slow down a little bit, please? <laughs> and um, uh, he said, that's not even my full run up. Oh. Ridiculous. I love that you asked him. Um, please, uh, would you mind just to slow down a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was terribly British about it. You um, can't help the heat. <laughs> no, exactly, yeah, I think I got out of the nets pretty quickly after that. <laughs> um, the next one, uh, Richard Gleeson. He's another transfer. He was somebody that was released from the Northern Superchargers and then subsequently was picked up by Manchester Originals. Um, he is a bowler. He's not super fast. Um, for those of you who may have heard when we did the podcast last year, he's a guy who, by his own admission, according to an interview, said he came to the game quite late. But um, he had a great T10. It was the inaugural Abu Dhabi T10. And when he was bowling, he bowled throughout the entire thing. And the only player who had a better bowling average than him was Dwayne Bravo. So that was a measurement of what, what he's capable of. He, he could definitely come in and he adds a little bit of variation and more consistency. So we could see him. Um, I really hope we do as well. And he's also had franchise experience. He played in the BBL and so forth. So is hoping. Uh, and last but not least, uh, another new player, another guy who had his first season this year was uh, Tom Hartley, who is a slow left arm bowler and uh, another Lancashire local player. Um, again, only 22, had his debut. He usually bats at number nine and um, I don't know, I feel like we will see him but given the strength of the spin bowlers that they've got, uh, when you think of uh, players like Shadow Khan, Matt Parkinson, et cetera, it might be a bit difficult to see him play. I, I think he'll potentially come in when Shadow Khan goes away for Pakistan duties, because I think off the top of my head, Shadow Khan's available for six or seven of the matches. It's just going to be so useful for him as a young player to get this glut of experience from somebody who's a little bit ahead of him in the pack like Matt Parkinson and somebody like Shadab Khan who's had all this international experience. But that's, that's the squad. Those are the 15 players that they've picked. Um, it's looking so much stronger than it was. I've got to be honest. Yeah, and I think what's great now is that they've got a really nice mix um, between established players, um, international players that have had a lot of franchise experience, and then some homegrown talent that really needs the practice, but you know, look like they have serious potential mm. um, and could get picked up by England any day. So I think it's really nice to have that variety. You've got a lot of, you know, sensible heads on your shoulders with Rabada and Butler, um, captaincy experience, and all of that as well. So. I think they've really thought this through this time. I think the first draft took everyone by surprise. It was, it was, I mean, we watched it, it was like three, four hours long and um, it was like a cattle market. It was, it was really confusing and you had, you know, 60 seconds to make the bet and, um, and a lot of players got, you know, a lot of players missed out on the teams that wanted them. So I think that they've now had the chance to sit down and think, right, we're really missing that department or this department. Um, and they've calculated it in a much better format. So I think this looks like a really well-balanced team. So um, should we move on to the ladies? Oh, yes. 
<laughs> um, so the ladies have now picked 13 players in their squad. I think looking down the list, they, they actually are owed still one international player because like the men's, they're allowed three international players. Uh, we'll go down the list, but I think we've only got two here. Um, their coach is Paul Shaw, who's a really established coach. He's just been appointed the new coach of the Northwest Thunder, which is uh, last year they re they rebranded and revamped how the domestic season works um, in the women's game, and they've kind of merged some players together and rebranded them. So the Northwest Thunder right. um, incorporates Lancashire. So you're going to see quite um, a theme here because a lot of these, most of these women, have come from Lancashire. Um, and now play for Thunder. So there's definitely a theme here. Um, let's run down the list. So we've got a couple of England central contracted players. Um, we've got Kate Cross, who is the most fantastic opening bowler. Um, she's a local player. She's centrally contracted to England. And um, she's had BBL experience. She's had franchise experience. Um, she plays for the Brisbane Heat. And her, her bowling averages say a lot about her. She's super talented. She had an awful injury like a year or a year and a half ago where she caught, um, a, caught, a, caught a ball on the rope, on the boundary rope. And she thought she'd completely snapped her leg in two. It was like one of the most awful injuries you've, you've seen. And she was, had to be stretched off and taken to hospital. And it was just awful. And her first thought she said in her head was, the next World Cup, like, am I going to be back for the next World Cup? And and thankfully, she's healing really, really well. And she's back to playing now. So her rehab's going really well. But um, she's in New Zealand right now with the England's women team. And they... She's part of the, it, right? <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, well, she's part of the team for the, for the one-day team. She was part of that team that, that beat the New Zealanders 2-1. So that's a great, a great bowler to start with for the Manchester Originals, Kate Cross. Um, next up, we've got Alexandra Hartley, mm -hmm. who is another England central contacted player. Um, she's a left arm spinner and she was part of the England one day international winning team in 2017. So great experience. She was actually named in the ICC team of the year for 2017. And her T20 bowling averages are something to be desired. They are an uh, average of 26. Yeah. Um, so she is up there. She's super talented. She bats lower down the order, um, but she's a great lady to have on the team. So I'm really excited to see her in action. Um, it's funny because she actually has a podcast herself. It's called um, the No Balls Podcast. Yes. And I think recently she was interviewed about who she gets on best with in the England team. And she joked that she's really good mates with Sophie Eccleston, but then she joked as well being like, which is surprising because she basically stole my job. <laughs> They're quite similar. And Sophie Eccleston um, was picked over Alex Hartley quite a few times recently. You know what? Her stats, her stats say it all, though. Really, I mean, like, I mean, Alex Hartley is a wonderful bowler, but I mean, oh, Sophie Eccleston's on another planet. So they have both in their squad, which is amazing. So Sophie Eccleston, as you said, even if you don't know much about cricket, if you, even if you don't know much about women's cricket, you've heard the name Sophie Eccleston. She is a force to be reckoned with. Um, she's only 21 years old and the left arm spinner. Um, her, her figures already are mad. Um, T20 wickets and she's got 58 T20 wickets already and over 100 yes. international wickets. That's um, so ridiculous. For the, for yeah. The, yeah. And she's the youngest she's the youngest woman to take fifty wickets in the last T twenty World Cup. So she's just yeah, I mean, people are expecting great things from her and she's constantly proving them right. Well, she's yeah, doing so well. The big thing that I constantly hear about Sophie Eccleston is she's not only the best women's bowler at the moment, but there are a lot of people that go out go around saying she is the best bowler in world cricket at the moment. Yeah, so exactly. Cool. And Manchester have got it. So, I mean, I could go on about her more, but I think yeah, we get to move on. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we move on. If we run out of time, they've got Sophie Eccleston. She's amazing. Um, so we've got, let's go on to the internationals now. So we've got from South Africa, we've got the former South African captain, um, Mignon Dupree. Um, she is a legend of the South African cricket game and she's an expert in franchises. Um, she's the first South African to score a thousand T20 international runs, which says a lot about her. She bats, she's normally an opening batsman, so one or two, 
Um, and she, yeah, her strike rate for T20 is over 100. Yeah, and last time South Africa played England, she struck a six in the final over to win the game. So <laughs> she definitely likes playing against us. Second uh, international player for Manchester Originals, we have another South African, and it's Lizelle Lee, who is also an opening batsman. Um, really destructive, big hitter, and she's got a lot of experience. A lot of experience in England as well, playing in English conditions, which is really useful, because she used to play for Surrey. And her strike rate is, again, over 100 for T20 internationals. It's 108. In the last game last season, she achieved 79 or 45 balls. That, so, I remember seeing that. It's, it, oh yeah. she's, like, she's one of those players that's kind of a bit like Rishabh Pant or somebody like that, that just, like, if she gets a bit between her teeth, you're done. She, she'll just yeah. talk you all over the place. Next up, we've got Georgie Boyce um, from Nottingham. She bats high up the order as well, and um, she's an all-rounder. She is also, yeah, bowls some, some medium pace, which is always useful. And she is one of the ladies that's with the North West Thunder, so you're going to see a lot of them coming through now. So she's got that local knowledge, local experience. Um, very promising, um, very promising ladies, Georgie Boyce. I'm looking forward to seeing her. We've also got Wicketkeeper. Um, there's a couple of actually, because Lizelle Lee does keep wicket sometimes too, but um, we've got specialist wicketkeeper, wiki Ellie Threckeld. She has the gloves for Lancashire, so again, another local player. And she's one of the first women in the country to be given a full-time domestic contract, which is huge. Um, so yeah, she's great with the gloves. Um, she's good with the bat. So that's the perfect wicketkeeper batsman for the Manchester Originals. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to seeing her. Yeah. Um, we also have a really promising uh, batting all-rounder in Emma Lamb. She is a right-hand opening batsman, so another competition for the top order there. Um, and she also bowls a right-arm medium pace. She's got good franchise experience. Um, she also plays for Lancashire, who now is the Northwest Thunder. Um, but her last season as an under-17s player, her batting average was over 100. And in 2018, she achieved both hers and Lancashire's best bowling figures in, t in a T20. She got four for 17. I'm, so, constantly, I'm, I'm really constantly surprised when, um, I think this is, it's a trend that I started to see a lot in women's cricket. Um, a, lot of, a lot of players have a specific thing that they do, but there's an awful lot of like multi-ability. So um, a lot, there's a lot of players who, our bats are our batsmen, but can bowl a bit and uh, provide useful bowling. Or well, there's bowlers who can bat a bit, and it's it's sort of a trend that I've seen more and more and more. It's it's fascinating, but I think that that just it helps the squads. Moreover, when you go, I have as a captain, you you look at your squad going, I could I have so many options here. It's great. Next up, we have another all rounder, Natalie Brown. Um, she's plays for Lancashire. She's a right handed batsman and right hand right arm medium pace bowler. So again, another all-rounder, local knowledge, very, very useful. Yeah. Um, we have Danielle Collins, who's a left-handed bat. So this is the first left-handed batter we've got in the team, which is always useful to have a mixture of both. She bats in the middle order. And um, again, local knowledge, she plays for the Northwest Thunders. So that's great. And it's great to have that camaraderie already that a lot of these girls played with each other. There's something really interesting about that and I think it helps especially in franchise competitions where one of the things you're trying to do is create a squad mentality but yeah. there are so many players who are playing for Manchester who already they know how each other play they know how to work with one another it's yeah, really exactly. to help because when you've got such short time to start coaching start the practice you you don't want to use a lot of the time sort of establishing how, you know each, each your, your teammates sort of yeah. you know what, what are your pros and cons like what are you best at like figuring out who each other are like these girls have already got it most most of them know each other they've played with each other so th that saves time and I think that they already have that um that yeah that great spirit that, that keeps them together at Lancashire and Northwest Thunder um next up we have got another potential opening batter so there's a couple here actually um Cordelia Griffith she is the opening batter for Middlesex, and okay. she's now called the Sunrisers under this, this new um, domestic um, 
season. Yeah. Which is, uh, Sunrise is the mix between London and the East. So we've got Middlesex, Essex, Northamptonshire, that kind of thing. Um, So she opens the batting for them. And she's also one of the few um, women that have been awarded a full-time domestic contract in this new women's elite structure. So that's really cool that she is a full-time. To finish off, we've got two bowlers. Uh We've got Hannah Jones who plays for Lancashire. She's a left arm orthodox spinner. She's got a good economy rate and she's really young and she's really okay. promising. I think that's... Three left arm spinners in the squad. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, like, because I genuinely, I, this is not decrying um, her ability, but when you think you've got, well, Sophie Eccleston, that you, like, you put in the team anyway. Oof, that, uh, that the <laughs> squad, yeah. Well, this is the thing. I think someone like Hannah Jones, um, even if she's not selected for the, for the first game, she's just having this experience working with Sophie and Alex, who uh, have a wealth of knowledge in the game. So I think she's going to learn so much. So what a great opportunity yeah. for her. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, we've got Alice Dyson, who again plays for Lancashire. She's, she's a tool. She's a right arm seamer. And she's part of the England Women's Development Programme. So she's really up and coming. Uh, got England eyes watching her as she's uh, training and uh, in development. So I think she's got, yeah, a lot of potential and it's good to have some seam in there and using her height, um, she gets up to, to pretty good speeds. Oh, great. The- uh, having, having someone like Kate Cross around as well is going to be amazing. Exactly. So that's the lot. Um, there was a lot to cover there. There's quite a few players that I hadn't heard of before, so I did find it quite difficult to research some of them. There was one player in particular that um, has, uh, I think it was Hannah Jones, who, there's another Hannah Jones as well, who's in the cricketing world, and she plays for Surrey. Right. And a lot of the data online, it was confusing which one they were actually talking about. So this is the difficulty <laughs> with researching some of the, um, unfortunately, with some of the women's games, is they don't, you know, don't have the data online for that. No, I, th- I, I'm, I think this is one of the things that the hundred's going to do for women's cricket is people are going to start getting stats in their own right and you're not going to have this confusion and the difficulty of finding stats amongst the women's game because, yeah, it's, it's, it's easy to find um, stats about people like Sarah Taylor or Sophie Eccleston or Meg Lanning or somebody like that, but um, finding some of the more developmental players, it's quite hard because I, you know, I've noticed even on a lot of major cricketing outlets, there's not a hell of a lot of news. So I'm really hoping that that's one of the many good things that comes out of the hundred for women's cricket. But yeah, uh, yeah right. I, I think um, shall we uh, shall we wrap up? I feel like we've uh, we've covered all of the bases there. Looking really good, right? Really good. Both teams are looking really strong, um, and it's quite clear as well with both teams who would open the bat, who would open the batting, who would open the bowling. Yeah. So they've got real strategy that they can implement. So I'm looking forward to seeing both of them in action. Two really strong teams. Definitely, definitely. So we will be back again for one of the next squad breakdowns. But before we do. Um, yeah, if you haven't yet, please do like and subscribe the channel if you like our channel. Uh, we really appreciate everybody checking out what we're doing and keeping in touch and keeping excited about the hundred. Um, we are on Twitter at Hundred Report, on Instagram at The Hundred Report, and obviously, if you're watching this, we're on YouTube right here. So please do subscribe below. But thanks again, and we will catch you on the next one. See you later. See you soon.